The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to HIPAA Audits, Much to Do About Nothing. My name is Carlos Leyva. I am the CEO of HIPAA Survival Guide um, and an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Here's today's agenda, but just a couple of housekeeping items for those of you who uh, are attending for the first time. We will take questions during the webinar. So you can type your questions into the chat session. Uh, and Martin Gwynn, the Director of Retail Operations for the Survival Guide, is monitoring the chat, and he will stop me at appropriate times, ask questions within the context of where we're at in, uh, in the presentation, and then we'll take more Q&A at the end. So what are we going to cover today? What's the comprehensive initiative vis-a-vis a HIPAA audit? Okay. What are the partial solutions that are everywhere? And, and really, uh, you could follow these partial solutions and have a death by a thousand cuts because, because they focus just on a subset of the problem and you lose sight of the forest for the trees. We're going to talk about components of audit coverage, education requirements, step-by-step -step review, and robust methodology. And then we're going to cover, I think, what's really near and dear to everybody's heart is, you know, what we really want to do is we want to avoid a finding of willful neglect because that's where the fines potentially start at $50,000 per violation. Now, why is it HIPAA has much to do about nothing? Well, because you should be working on your compliance initiative right now. You should be doing it on a requirement by requirement basis. The biggest threat to any covered entity in the business is not getting audited because the, the probability of getting audited, any single organization getting audited, it's tiny. The, um, the probability is significantly higher that you're going to have a major breach. Of course, after you have a major breach, you're going to get audited. And the, probably, the probability is the second most likely probability is that a patient complains to HHS. Okay. Now, a patient. We'll talk about this a little bit because we covered it a couple of webinars ago about individual lawsuits. But under HIPAA, a patient can't bring a complaint directly, a lawsuit directly. They have to file a complaint with HHS. Now, if in the body of that complaint, if, it is, if it's obvious that the business associate or covered entity is in willful neglect, then an audit is mandated. No choice. Anything that looks like willful neglect from a complaint by a patient, you're going to get audited. All right? So that's more likely than, than being selected randomly to participate uh, in an audit. So what would be an example of something that is willful neglect on its face. Well, we actually have a really, really good example from SIGNET about three years ago or three and a half years ago where they refused to provide patient PHI for about 19 or 20 patients. They just absolutely refused to provide it. That's been part of the privacy rule forever from day one. If a patient asks for PHI, they get it, and they're supposed to get it within 30 days. And Signet got fined $4.3 million. Now, Signet was kind of a special case because they went rogue. They didn't really listen to HHS. I mean, Signet was a mess. But what triggered it was their just outright refusal to provide patients with their PHI. So, what's the comprehensive initiative before we get to that one of the learning objectives for today? provide a foundation understanding of requirements for a comprehensive HIPAA audit preparation. So you should be working on it, even though you may not get there for six months or seven months. You should be working on a step-by-step -step plan that will get you there. So what does comprehensive audit coverage mean? What is not comprehensive? Key component of coverage. Why tracking where you're at in your program really matters. Systems thinking, how not to change your finally. 
uh, want to spend some time on how, what you can do immediately to hopefully avoid a finding of willful neglect. So the bottom line is we want to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of how your audit preparation should be based on full coverage of HIPAA requirements and what that entails from a practical perspective with the emphasis in, in number six being what to, what to attack first. How do you start? What to attack first? Okay. Uh, Carlos, so, well, let, let me interrupt yes. for a second. And um, the, the audio is breaking up very badly. I don't know if it's on my end. Um, I mean, I don't know if, if I can be heard well or whether it's uh, on your end, if someone can answer that why question. Don't you, why, don't you ask for, why, don't you, why don't you ask for a raise of hands? Okay. Um, you hear me fine? Is that what I'm getting? Or is my audio breaking up? I hear you. I hear you okay. You were breaking up a little bit. They hear me. Yeah. Uh, well, it must be localized because um, they're getting good sound from both of us on some end. I don't know what it is. Um, we can try talking again and I see what happens. You. I can hear you again. What? Um, I was, was going to say try try your headphone again because it, I'm getting you badly. Uh, you're getting me okay, and Carlos is breaking up. Is what um, some can hear everything well, some uh, can hear me well, and some hear you breaking up. So, all right. Well, we're going to continue. We're going to continue here. Here's, we got the. We got the. We're going to make the, um, the best of it, right? So here's the yep. comprehensive. Here's comprehensive defined. If you're going to have a comprehensive program, you're going to have to identify the the these three areas of the three-legged stool on a requirement by requirement basis: the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. And as it turns out. The uh, HHS audit protocol, these are the three rules that HHS focuses on for the audit protocol. This is the HIPAA universe, the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. Okay? So here's our compliance equation. How do you attack this? You've got to have policies plus processes plus tracking mechanisms to be able to show visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance, which means, I'll give you an example. So you have a training policy. And the auditor says, well, let's see your training policy. And you show the auditor your training policy. And the auditor says, well, talk to me about what kind of organizational processes do you have to support your policy. Is it classroom training? Is it video-based based training? Uh, who do you train? Is there a test? Okay, and then finally, the auditor would say, okay, well, then show me the database, the spreadsheet, the whatever HR system that that demonstrates to me that you actually have followed the policies and processes that you have in place. In other words, I want to see when Jane Doe nursed on the fourth floor last got trained, what she got trained on, etc. You, you have to be a, this is for every requirement. It's not at a global level. This is at a requirement level. You got to have policies in place, processes in place, and the ability to track process results. And if you have that, you're on your way to establishing a culture of compliance. You're also on your way to um, to complying with the audit requirements, to, to be able to have a good faith story as to what you're doing vis-a-vis -vis your HIPAA compliance initiative. So your audit preparation must allow you to produce and track visible demonstrable evidence for each requirement of the HIPAA rules. And HHS's audit protocol was broken down on a requirement by requirement basis. This is really not rocket science. Those requirements have been in the rules for the law for forever. All HHS did was it created a spreadsheet that listed what the requirements were. There was no uh, mystery to it. So audit preparation. What does this as a practical as a practical matter, what does this mean? Well you first of all you have to have a clear understanding of each requirement. Now, obviously you're not going to be able to comply with a requirement if you don't know that it exists. 
right? So you can use HHS's audit protocol. You can use our checklist because we walk down every requirement. That's part of what the privacy rule checklist does. That's part of what the security rule checklist does. You must be able to show what, as we just discussed, VDE, visible demonstrable evidence, for each requirement, right? We'll get to a number here, but there's a total of 169. 169 requirements, and if you want to show uh, an auditor or your boss where are you on these 169 requirements, you should be able to say, well, we've done 50 of them, we have you know 25 planned, and you know the rest we, we got to get to next year or whatever because we don't have the budget, right? But that's how you need to attack your audit. If you currently can't show VDE for each requirement, at least you got to have a plan in place for how you're working it. So, you know, that's probably good enough to make a good faith argument that you haven't stuck your head in the sand. Yeah, we understand that there's 169. Here's where we're at, you know, and here's how we plan to do the to do the rest. And if you haven't had a major breach, um, you know, you, that probably by itself is going to be enough to avoid a finding of willful neglect. Obviously, items two and three mandate that you have the, the ability to track progress. That means that tracking mechanism, the third part of the equation, you've got to be able to track process results. Otherwise, how do you show the evidence that you're complying? Right? Because the policy is just an organization's intentions, what it likes to do, what it says it wants to do. Processes are descriptions of how it is going to fulfill the policy. That's all nice, it's all, you got to have it, but unless you have the results of the process, it's just mother of an apple pie. It's not going to it's not going to help you very much. So bottom line is all about requirements. I'm going to I'm going to pause here and just see if there's any questions at all, Martin. Yeah, well, we got a couple. Um, this apparently is a regional thing from what I can tell. Uh, because we can be heard in Idaho, I know that for sure. Both of us can. Is there any situation where a CE would not have to follow HIPAA? No, there is none. There is no HIPAA light for small CEs. There's a thing called the flexibility principle built into uh, the security rule where you can take into consideration the size of your organization, uh, you, the, the complexity of your environment, your budget, you can take in, into consideration these things, and the flexibility principle was built into the security rule by uh, HHS purportedly to allow the security rule to scale from really small mom-and-pop providers to big hospitals, okay? But where people get confused, uh, especially with respect to the security rule, is security rule has two types of requirements, two types of implementation specifications, okay? It's got required implementation specifications that everybody's got to do no matter what. Then it's got addressable implementation specifications. And people misperceive that they can ignore an addressable implementation specification. And you can't. What addressable means is, look, implement the implementation specification as, as defined right here. If you can't implement it, the specification as defined in, in the regs, then implement a reasonable alternative. And if you can't implement a reasonable alternative, you better have a damn good compelling reason, this is my interpretation now, you better have a damn good compelling reason why you chose to ignore an implementation specification. So the answer is no. There are no instances where a CE um, that's, you know, obviously, CE is defined as somebody as a healthcare provider, or a business associate of a CE cannot comply. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you seen OCR fine CEs for maintaining compliance as you define visible demonstrative evidence, but not using all parameters of the OCR audit protocols? HHS does not, does not tend to make those findings public. It, it, it will say that such and such an organization, you know, 
has to implement a corrective action plan and they got to do X and Y and Z at some high level. But they, I've yet to see anywhere where there's some granular report that, you know, you didn't implement 5064, 5, 164 by 524, blah, 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 blah. They don't, they don't report, they don't report out that way. Okay. Is the NIST SP 800-66 also a good resource, or should I not bother reviewing it and focus on HHS audit spreadsheet, which is OCRs? The problem, the problem with the NIST documents, especially the ones that purport to help you uh, implement the security rule. Okay, the problem with it, the problem with it is. Now we all know that that the HIPAA rules are scriptive and not prescriptive. They describe what the requirements are, but they don't tell you how to go about implementing them. Right? They don't tell you the how to. Now the NIST documents don't tell you the how to either. Right? So in that sense, they're confusing. What the NIST documents do, uh, especially the ones that focus on implementing the security rule, is they say, okay, here are the requirements. You know, and they kind of list the requirements. And then what they say is, here are 20 questions that you should be asking yourself for this for this requirement. Well, that's not very much help, right? You read those 20 questions, and you want to pull your hair out because, again, it's just, they're just playing this 20-question game. They're not telling you, and they're never going to tell you, okay? This, this is the thing. NIST and HHS, is, they're never going to tell you the how to comply because then, would open up themselves to an argument and say, well, wait a minute, you told us to do it this way, we did it that way, and then you say we're not in compliance. Okay? So don't hold your breath for NIST or HHS to ever tell you the how to. And, and so to a degree, you, you might get some value out of looking at, at the 800 series from NIST, but personally, I, I, I found them to be extremely confusing and not very helpful at all. <clears throat> and the favorite is reasonable and appropriate for an organization your size. What does that mean in English? Um, yes. What if you have trained and have certificate for training from a previous employer, do you need retaining retraining at a current employer before your certificate expires? I don't. But, well, I, I missed that reasonable and appropriate. Was that a question? No, I was just using the reasonable, appropriate, the weasel words they use all the time. What's the question? Okay. If you are trained and have a certificate for training from a previous employer, do you need re retraining at a current, a current employer's before the certificate expires? Yeah, I don't, I don't uh, you know, there are no certificates that, that I'm aware of that HHS recognizes. You know, I know that there's people out there that issue certificates, but, uh, you know, and some of them may be accredited by God knows who, but, you know, the, 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 whether or not you were trained your previous hospital or, or, or practice, the, the, the real, the real question is how, how are you trained? Because high tech changed everything. Are you up to date on the omnibus rule? Are you up to date on, on all the changes introduced by high tech? If I'm conducting the training, right, if I am the privacy officer, the security officer, I don't care how you got trained in your last class. I'm training you again because I want you to have the specific training that, that we recommend because our training is up to date with the omnibus rule, and we want to make sure you're, you're up to date as well. Okay, I'm a CE and have BAAs in place with the clinics and hospitals that I provide PHI, EPHI to. They forward that information on their EHR vendor with whom they have a BAA in place. Question, do I need a BAA with their EHR, EHR vendor? Well, let me say this. Usually it's a covered entity that has the relationship with the EHR vendor directly, not through a BAA, usually, okay? And so in that scenario, the CE has to have a, 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 a BAA with the EHR vendor. That's, that's pretty clear, okay? But 
let me give you this scenario because man, this is what you were getting at. So let's say you have an EHR vendor that also actually stores your PHI on Microsoft Azure platform or Amazon S3 or whatever Google's got the equivalent of, then your EHR vendor better have a subcontractor agreement with Google, Amazon, or Microsoft or they're in violation of the rules. But in that particular case, the covered entity doesn't have to have a, a, a BAA with Google, Microsoft. It's the EHR vendor. So you are you are responsible for those business associates that you directly do business with. If those business associates do business with other business associates, they're responsible for those business associates that they directly do business with. That's how it works. That's all we have for the moment. All right, so let me continue. And so this, I'm going to go over real quick. It's, it's a lot of material here. You can read the slides. I don't want to read to you. This is the audit, audit preparation, OCR audit protocols uh, for the privacy rule, okay? And you can just Google HHS audit protocol and get these, okay? And you can see here that we like to break it up. This is, this is not how... HHS does it. This is how we do it in our products. This is how we do it in our checklist. We like to break up the privacy rule in three major sections. The first one is uses and disclosures, and that goes from 164.502 to 164.514. Okay, and then we look at what we call the privacy rules patient bill of rights. This is what Signet violated. That goes from your notice of privacy practices 164.520 through 164.528 documentation, and finally, the administrative requirements of the privacy rule, and those are all contained in 164.530. Okay, for the security rule, they're broken up, as you would imagine, by safeguards. So you have requirements for the administrative safeguards, requirements for the technical safeguards, requirements for the physical safeguards. Breach notification is treated a little bit different. Okay, there are 10 requirements, and essentially, HHS wants to assure itself that you know how to do a breach uh, analysis to see if a breach occurred, or you have letters, templates in place to notify individuals if you need to notify them. Uh, you have methods for notifying the media. In other words, how prepared are you for a breach? And I guarantee you, if you're in this space long enough, you're going to suffer a breach. You're going to suffer a breach before you suffer an audit. Okay? And so it's a little bit different, a lot less requirements, but essentially you have the tools in place to analyze a breach, determine that it was breached, notify the patients accordingly, a methodology for doing uh, these things. And, and we cover that in our breach notification framework. It's, it's a slightly different animal, but again, it's, it's, it's all requirement base. So here's the totals. We have 81 requirements for the privacy rule, 78 for the security rule, and 10 for the breach notification rule for, for a total of 169. So let's talk about partial solutions because I'm sure many of you have encountered these and we talked about the next 5,000 cuts. But before I want to talk a little bit about wetware versus software because you know there's a lot of um, software out there that says you know, we're HIPAA compliant. And first of all, you should be you should be aware that that's just marketing speak. Okay? There are no such thing, there's no such thing as a HIPAA compliant product. Why? Because by definition the only entities that can be HIPAA compliant are covered entities and business associates. You don't have HIPAA compliant products. What you have are products that help you become HIPAA compliant. That's different. Right? So Vendors want to put this marketing spin on their EHR software that you know that we're HIPAA compliant, and that essentially lulls uh, covered entities into uh, a, a false sense of security, thinking that the EHR vendor has just taken care of the HIPAA problem, where nothing could be further from the truth. Here we're describing a difference between software and wetware, and wetware is biological gray matter in a fixed medium, or it's what's between your ears. Right, tacit knowledge suitable for other humans to consume. In other words, wetware is telling you what to do. Wetware isn't software, right? Wetware is what you need to know 
in order to comply. Partly what you need to know is you need to understand all the requirements. And then you, then you need to understand what kind of processes you would implement for each requirement. And then you need to understand how you would go about tracking each requirement. I am not aware of any piece of software out there that goes to that level of detail. Okay? A lot of software is um, many times nothing more than a glorified repository, something that you could put on Google Apps, Microsoft SharePoint, or on a file folder somewhere, right? So be careful what you're buying when you're buying HIPAA compliance solutions, right? Now, there are some that are definitely helpful. You know, I mean, like, if you're going to do a, a risk assessment, I don't know how you do it without network scanning software, okay? That, but that's a different thing. It's a really specific problem that's being solved. So what we like to say is wetware is knowledge transfer vehicle. It's a focus, it focuses on education, right? So this is coined, this is a term that we coined because this is what we believe our products do. They're wetware. They teach you how, they teach you the how-to to comply, and the focus is on education software generally is where you store and manage your visible demonstrable evidence and points. And I'm not saying that that's not useful, but the message here is don't confuse one with the other. Okay? Caveat emptor, be aware of what you're buying. So compliance software should be much more than a file repository. It should help you to effectively manage your initiative. From our perspective, compliance software without wetware is really an empty container. It's just stuff you, you put your stuff in there, but you know it doesn't really help you with understanding that you're putting the right stuff in there. Wetware, wetware is self-contained. Software requires wetware. Now, there's some solutions out there that remind you, you know, when your uh, business associate contract is up with ABC Corporation, and so you get an alert. You know, all those things are helpful, but those are kind of those are kind of tickler systems. They're like, oh, by the way, you should be doing this. They're not really addressing how you should go about complying. So, caveat enter, compliance software is often sold as wetware. What other kinds of partial solutions are out there? There's solutions out there for doing risk assessments. There's solutions out there for doing incident management. There are repositories out there. There's autom automated privacy verification, security incident tracking, network monitoring. There are nothing wrong with these point solutions, but you just need to understand that if you buy an incident management solution, it's not gonna it's gonna help you with incident management and it's not gonna help you with the other eighty some requirements of the security rule. Okay? And so you, you know file uh, developing a repository, in fact we give you some guidance in our subscription on the kind of repository you could define. Easily done on something like Google Apps Sites, where you just have websites and you have a taxonomy, but you can take that same taxonomy and put it on a file folder, I mean on, on a network uh, server, and that becomes your single version of the truth. Repositories are not that hard to do. Uh, you know, so it, it's security incident tracking, obviously. If that's one of the first questions I'm going to ask. How are you tracking uh, security incidents? Well, one way you could do it is Define, define the process within your organization of how people go about reporting a security incident. Who do they talk to? Who logs it? What kind of documentation is produced? You know, when does it go to the uh, privacy officer? How do we know, you know? How do we determine whether or not it's a breach? What's the process that we go through? The point here is, I hope that you're getting is, software. By itself is not the answer. If you don't have the policies, processes, and tracking mechanisms, you're not you're not going to be on your way to um, full compliance. You're going to probably have a false sense of security that you made progress where you perhaps have made very little. Now, obviously, there's uh, consulting organizations that will come in and do gap analysis and remediation. There's people organizations that will come in after a breach and do forensics, which are that specialized work, and, and you know what? After you've had a major breach, you got to you got to bring them in. Uh, there's disaster recovery and business continuity consultants that focus on that particular piece of it. So you get the idea here. There are a million and one partial solutions out there. Same thing is true for training. Now, I got to tell you this because I've I've gone through it. In the past, prior to the high tech act, I would bet like 90% of it uh, in, in clinical environments. 
training for clinicians and doctors, et cetera, is still this dumbed down, feel good training, you know, that says, hey, if you wouldn't say it in an elevator, don't say it, you know, it's just, it's not good enough anymore. And the reason it was okay in the past is because I'll tell you the dirty little secret that you probably already know. Prior to the and in fact, until recently, and I don't think HHS has gotten in gear yet vis-a-vis -vis enforcement, HIPAA was an unenforced paper tiger. Nobody ever got fined for nothing. So it didn't matter what kind of training you had. You could have the dumbest down training available, and you could just say, yeah, we train our employees. So we're all good. Or we got, yeah, we run them through this uh, certification program. It's all good. Nobody ever vetted it because HIPAA was unenforced. Okay, so you need that stuff mindset. It's not unenforced anymore. It got real peak. The liability is huge. You know, uh, the next webinar we're going to talk about Anthem. The game is really changed. So you need to look at your training. Bottom line is there's hundreds of point solutions available, hundreds. What do you need if you're looking for comprehensiveness, though? So let me let me stop here and just catch my breath and Martin, see if there's questions. At this point, we don't have any new question, uh, so I encourage everybody to ask. Okay, so part of comprehensiveness is education. You need to have your people up to speed on the High Tech Act and how it's changed the privacy rule, how it's changed the security rule, and, and, and the fact that it introduced the breach notification rule, right? The High Tech Act was the game changer, okay? A lot of people thought the omnibus rule was the game changer. The omnibus rule was just final rulemaking that emanated from high tech. Right after the high tech act came out, HHS was mandated to perform a certain amount of rulemaking. The fact of the matter is, they slow walked it, and until they got to the omnibus rule, they hadn't really finalized it. And it's still not final. There's still one piece, just so that you know, that's not final, and that's accounting for disclosure. Okay, and that might not be final for a few years or longer because the technology to really account for disclosures the way the rule is written uh, is not available. So HHS has simply been punning on that part, right? But other than that, the omnibus rule kind of tied it all together. Everything that emanated from the High Tech Act, the final rules came out of the omnibus rule, and it touched the privacy rule, touched the security rule, uh, touch breach notification and touch business associates. Okay, so the bottom line is you, you need a more literary, literate, not literary, a more literate staff now. This 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 is not, HIPAA shouldn't be treated like this necessary evil that everybody groans that they got to go through HIPAA training. It's becoming, you have to make it part of the organizational DNA if you ever have any uh, chance of establishing uh, a culture of compliance. And so, Training around risk assessment, training around risk management. I mean, obviously, these are the first two implementation specifications of the security rule, and they can entire they, they, they by themselves swallow the entire rule. You definitely need some guidance around risk assessment if you if you've never done one. And the, the explosion of social media, where we are nurses and doctors taking pictures, posting them on Facebook. There's the problem with holding PHI on mobile devices and getting lost. There's the whole potential disaster that's going to happen sooner or later on the cloud because, first of all, healthcare is moving to the cloud in a big way, and I, I totally support that because the economics of the cloud are too compelling, right? So it used to be the factories in the, uh, in the early 20th century generate their own electricity until uh, until the uh, electricity companies got so good at being able to generate and distribute it that it no longer makes sense to generate your own electricity. This is how you're, we're now renting computing CPUs. We just rent it. We rent it from the cloud. The problem is, what happens if your EHR vendor goes um, bankrupt? What happens if your EHR vendor is not performing? How do you get your data? How do you get your data back now? They own your data. They own the application. What kind of contractual provisions have you put in place to have a possible chance of recovering? Essentially, yes, the EHR model, software as a service, is going to be the way things are done. That's the game has changed. But you've got to put in some protections, or you're going to be essentially 
have some catastrophe that you're not going to be able to easily uh, recover from, and that's going to lead to uh, audits, lawsuits, etc. So here's the bottom line. Post high tech, more compliance literacy is required. Requirements, we talked about this. This is how we approach it. Right? So our HIPAA privacy rule checklist walks through every requirement of the privacy rule. And for each requirement, so this is privacy rule, and this is number one, privacy rule, use in disclosure, 0001. For, this is the description. This, this item addresses sanction and training issues surrounding a determination of whether the rule has been violated. And then for each requirement, we give you what the policy statement should be, we give you suggested processes that underpin that policy, and we give you suggested tracking mechanisms for tracking process results. Often we have uh, spreadsheets and other tools that will help you track process results, and we do that on a requirement by requirement basis. Here's the here's part of the checklist for the patient's of rights. And so forth, this is a part of the checklist for the administrative requirements. And we do the same thing for the security rule. We just walk through the administrative safeguards at a requirement by requirement level. Now, because the security rule is so complex, the requirements in the security rule are broken down. In fact, risk assessment is the first implementation, implementation specification, and we break that up into sub-segments. Sub and th this was really, uh, borrowed from NIST, gather data, define threats and vulnerabilities, in other words, there are lots of requirements in the security rule uh, that pertain to a risk assessment. It's just not a one for one. It, there's probably 20 that uh, deal with um, the risk assessment and then risk management program. But the bottom line is we're attacking it on a requirement by requirement uh, basis. Okay, and finally, same thing for the breach notification. You have a methodology in place that that you, that, you, that you follow that tells you when notification is triggered. You understand the time frames, the timeliness uh, of reporting the HHS, reporting to the media. Now, m most people uh, understand that I think if the numbers were, I believe it's, it's over 500 um, in aggregate, you have to, you have to report to HHS within 60 days of knowing about the breach, okay? But if you just had a breach of one record, you still have to report that to HHS at the end of the calendar year. So at the end of the calendar year, you have 60 days to report that one breach. So notifying HHS and notifying individuals is always required. It depends on the time frame, right? The individuals always get notified within, within the 60 days. HHS, it depends on the number, and media, uh, it, the media is going to depend on the number as well. And I think I'm doing this from memory. I think it's, if, it's, if it's over 501 records in a given state or jurisdiction, then you have to report the major media within that state. Okay. So these are the requirements. Having model letters, etc. These are how you go about meeting the audit protocol for the breach notification rule. So essentially, would you know a breach if you saw one? Are you tracking incidents? Are you prepared for notification? Those are the questions you should be asking. You need to have answers for those if you want to show an auditor that, yeah, we're meeting, we're meeting these 10 requirements that HHS uh, defined. Okay, Martin, any questions now? Yes, uh, here's a question. Isn't everything slash requirements that are listed in the High Tech Act and the Omnibus Rule Included in the updated privacy and security rules. Um, yes, I mean, so so the High Tech Act was the statute, right? The High Tech Act was part of ERA, the stimulus package that came out in two thousand nine, and that's what Congress does, right? It's the law, right? Now, almost always. Congress uh, promulgates laws, and then it assigns rulemaking to certain agencies. Well, the rulemaking, right, that's found in the, in the code of, uh, in the Federal Register, the rulemaking in this particular case was assigned to HHS. 
So then HHS goes through this rulemaking that essentially interprets, tries to interpret uh, in as um, rigorous a manner as it can the intention of the statute. So the, so the attack, the statute may define something at a broad level, like um, business associates are now on, you know, are now liable for compliance with the security rule, and then the rules provided by HHS will then define, well, what, what does that really mean in practice, okay? So everything came from the High Tech Act and the previous privacy and security rule. So prior, prior to the High Tech Act, we had privacy and security rule that existed was never enforced. The High Tech Act came out in 2009 and turned that world upside down, okay? And it impacted, it impacted the privacy rule, obviously, the security rule, obviously, and High Tech introduced the breach notification rule, okay? And then HHS went through a series of rulemaking, some about breach notification, you know, there were three or four different areas, but they were just implementing with the High Tech Act, rulemaking based on the High Tech Act, and the omnibus rule is not a rule by itself. The omnibus rule is a place where changes were gathered for the privacy rule, updates to the privacy rule, updates to the security rule, updates to the breach notification rule, and it did introduce some new things like uh, making genetic information now PHI, and you know, if a person's been dead for over 50 years, then that is no longer PHI. It did introduce some new things of its own that um, that weren't even part of the High Tech Act, but that was a really, really narrow subset of items that it introduced. Okay, this is a, a multi-part question. Regarding cloud computing, would you recommend a private implementation versus a hybrid or public instance? And could you give an example of the ownership type language that should be in our contract with them to ensure we maintain ownership of the EPHI or is the language I need in the updated BAA language 164.308 be one. No, let's just start with the latter. There is, it's not going to be in the BAA. The BAA doesn't live, doesn't deal with these, this level of detail. You can put it in the BAA, but it's not going to be in the BAA in some standard BAA. It's not going to be in the BAA that, that we sell, right? Because we sell a model BAA. This is, this is a specialized contract. Not everybody's got a cloud vendor, and so uh, th those are things that you can add, you, you, you can add and should add to your BAA contract. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a couple scenarios, right? So here's the thing: what happens? What what, what happens if let's say you've got a good relationship with your EHR vendor and you really love them, but they have some catastrophe because Katrina strikes and they weren't as prepared for Katrina as they should have been, and now they down, now they're down for three days. You can't get access to your PHI. And, it, and, and they're saying, you know, we don't know. We may be down for a couple of weeks. Well, you know what? One basic thing you should have in your contract is, and if I were writing a contract for a, a, a EHR vendor, I was like, okay, I want real-time replication of my data to a server that I control, okay? Real time. You're going to have to pay for that, but, but if you do that real-time, I mean, Right? Every time a record gets updated here, it gets propagated over there. I own this server, so that's a form of protection. Now, that's step one, so you have access to your data. But the insidious thing about cloud computing is if you don't know the structure of that data, which you won't because it's proprietary to the HR, and you don't have the application to access that data, what good is it going to do you? Right? The data is now in some cryptic, God knows what, uh, you know, relational database format or relational database plus something else. So another basic step would be, hey, we want every we want a copy of your software as a service in escrow. Because if you're down too long, if you go out of business, if we get pissed off and we want to change, we want to be able to not only access our data, right, but we want to access the software that accesses our data. Because without that, 
then you, you don't have, you know, you're, you're stuck. You're not going to be able to do it, no matter how good your technical people are. Now, the question of whether you do a public cloud or a private cloud, that's going to really depend on the sophistication of the IT environment that you have. These public clouds or private clouds are, um, you know, they're difficult to manage. Now, sure, you can get a private cloud. You can get a private cloud and um, and have the vendor manage it, right? But having a private cloud and have the vendor manage it doesn't really get you out of the scenario that I just described, right? It, it may be more secure. You might think that you can keep the bad guys out better, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't solve this fundamental problem that once you go to a cloud-based CHR vendor, they own your data and you're locked in. That's the issue. And then you better put some things in your contract that let you get out of that locked in when something goes wrong. Okay. I just started on a compliance initiative as an MSP and BA. My first project is risk assessment. What else should I be doing at the same time? Am I missing something? <laughs> well, yes, you should be starting on the risk assessment because that's everything. If you, do, if you don't do a risk assessment, you really can't implement the rest of the security rule. That's for one thing, right? So if you're talking about the security rule, yes, that's the place you start. You've got to do, do the risk assessment. But the risk assessment is an analytical step. The risk management the second implementation specification is actually where you implement that stuff. But yes, by all means. But what should you be doing? And we're going to touch. We're going to touch on avoiding willful neglect. That's one step of avoiding willful neglect. If you haven't done a risk assessment, you know, ever, or the last one you did was five, six years ago, you're probably in willful neglect. Okay. So I tell people do a risk assessment, even if it's a bad one. All right. There's no. There's no prizes for doing the best risk assessment is, did you get started? Do you understand what this is? Did you make a, a good faith attempt? Now, to be honest, for small practices, mid-site clinics, blah, 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 you're, you're not going to be able to do a risk assessment on your own because you really need technology, you know, to scan the software, scanning software, and it's not super expensive, and some of it is free, but even the free stuff, you got to know what you're doing, okay? So despite the fact that HHS says, oh, you don't need to buy any software or you know that that's really BS. You can't you can't do a risk assessment uh, identifying threats and vulnerabilities without some sort of automation. But other things you should be doing. Well, what about the privacy rule? That's just the risk assessment is one of eighteen or more. Well, just one of eighteen or more implementation specifications for the security rule. You know, let's talk about the privacy rule. Are your notice of privacy practices up to date? Have you trained your people on the privacy rule? Do you have a model? Do you have a privacy rule policy that you've distributed and gotten people to sign? These are like basic things, right? Have you named a privacy officer? Okay, these are just basic things that you can get done right away. They don't, right? So you could focus. So if you just focus on the risk assessment, which is arguably the most important thing, yeah, you could be letting a lot of just easy to take care of things just drop by the wayside. That's all the questions we have at this time. Okay, so here's an example of a checklist item where I said we have a description, we have a reference to the rule here, it's 164.502, we have policy statements, and we take these policy statements and that becomes your model policy statement for the privacy rule, but we also have processes that should be implemented to support that policy, and we have suggest suggested tracking mechanisms spreadsheets, documents, like for example, tracking incident document incidents, you know, for a small practice, we have an incident tracking uh, spreadsheet. We have an incident document uh, template that that walks you through how to document an incident, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is what I mean by attacking the rules at a requirement by requirement level. Same thing is true for the security rule. We go through the administrative safeguards, you go through a risk assessment, here's your policy, right? Here's your policy, here's the processes, here's how you ought to track them, okay? For breach notification, we actually have about 12 or 14 um, flow charts that help you figure out whether or not, uh, and a methodology, a narrative on top of it, to help you figure out whether or not 
you know, breach notification is triggered, right? So, you know, it was it, first of all, was PHI uh, in, in paper, was it paper, right? If it was paper, then you just go to notification analysis because this PHI at rest, PHI in motion, all that has to do with ePHI, okay? And then you ask yourself, was the PHI at rest? Was it something in the database on a, on a file server? Okay, if it was, um, if it was at rest, did you implement any kind of encryption that is greater than or equal to the NIST protocol? Okay, if you did, then you're done because you can take advantage of the uh, of the safe harbor. If you don't, if you didn't, then you need to go um, do the notification analysis to review whether or not a breach was triggered. Right, so. Even just trying to figure out the incident, you got to first determine: is it paper? Was it at rest? Was it in motion? Okay, you got you to you got to understand these things. And if you haven't trained some individuals to go through this methodology and analytical framework, you're really going to be at a loss when the first time um, you know you encounter a breach. So tracking, we also have what we call our. Um, scorecards for the privacy rule and security rule by requirement where you can say you can give each requirement zero means it's missing one means it's planned B says yes we got a we got a basic implementation of that we're not really all that happy with it but we have implemented something F is functional yes we got something that's working for us it's you know it may need some improvements but it's been working for us for about six months and E is excellent we have a mature answer for this particular requirement. Okay, so we have one of those for the security rule checklist. And again, yes, I'm talking in reference to our products because, we, because we've gone down this road and tried to solve it. But I'm also trying to convey to you, no matter what product you use or who you select, you need to be able to deal with the rules at a requirement by requirement level. Okay. Tracking for breach notification. Essentially, you have a breach notification system in place with all that in, entails the analytical framework, the um, documents, the templates, etc. So let's talk a little bit about methodology. Well, let me take a. Is there any questions here? <clears throat> yes. Uh, do the checklist and other HIPAA survival guide documents identify the HHS, HHS rule they are addressing? Yes, in that line that says reference. Let me go back to one. See here? Yeah. In the line that says reference, this is part of the checklist. It's telling you which one, and it's giving you some other places to look, like seeing this special publication, 830. Yeah? And so, yes, the part of the, it is telling you which, which requirement is being addressed. Now, our numbers don't add up to the HHS um, total number because if you go look at the HHS protocol, they may have like 10 things under 164.502, right? And we didn't choose to treat them as 164.502 as 10 separate things. It just didn't make sense to us from that perspective. We just said, oh, no, these are 164.502, and that's where there's some discrepancy in the number because you can just go out there and look at some of those uh, protocols uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you an example real quick so that you can visually see what I am talking about. Okay. See here? The first five, six say 164.502, then you have three for 164.504, and so forth. So they're kind of like for 164.512, it looks like they got 12 or 15, right? And it's just part of that one requirement. They chose to break it down this way. You know, I don't know in their infinite wisdom, but, uh, you know, we don't, we don't deal with it that way. We, we deal with it with, uh, we deal with it vis-a-vis -vis the entire requirement. So, sorry, okay. I should have, um, let me, hold on a second. Let me, okay. let me skip back to where I was. Uh, 
Yes, methodology, okay. Okay, okay. the next, next question. What are the audit, audit components for a business associate? They're the same. <laughs> They're the same. There's no, there's no distinction. Okay, there's no business associate light. There's no, I'll give you an example. There are some things where they wouldn't be exactly the same. So if you're a lawyer or an accountant or an accountant or a consultant and you show up to some covered entities site and as part of what you're doing for that covered entity, you, you are looking at PHI, you're a business associate, okay? But I'm not storing, you know, as, 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 a, as my client, I don't store my client's PHI on my servers, you know, I don't, I look at it when I'm there, so, but I would still have to go through the security rule and say, have I done a risk assessment, you know, and uh, I probably would have to do a minimalist risk assessment to say, in the, in, in the case where I might have some uh, of my client's PHI because I'm doing some analysis or something on their behalf, I've taken these precautions. And, you know, there may be some in that particular case uh, that are addressable that I may say, you know, I looked at this, this really doesn't apply, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to do it because it just doesn't, it doesn't apply. But it, I looked at it, I documented why it doesn't apply, I documented why no alternative solution applies. So you, so there's that, but that doesn't get you out of going through the security rule and going through the privacy rule and going through the training. Right? It's just there's some flexibility there. But the majority of business associates are actually storing, creating, accessing PHI on their own servers on behalf of the covered entity. That's the case for a cloud-based CHR vendor. That's the case for, you know, billing uh, vendors. I mean, you just on and on, right? There are just PHI being stored everywhere. In that scenario, you're, you're, as a business associate, you're on the hook, just like the covered entity, for the same requirements. Uh, that's, that's all we have for now. Okay. So just a little bit about a Agile, right? This, this, this HIPAA uh, regulatory maze really has proved daunting for organizations of all sizes, large or small, right? Everybody's challenged by this. And you need to take an approach. Don't don't form a committee to name a committee to get started on this thing. The, the biggest thing you can do is get started right away. The, 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 this is as complex as it can be technically. Most projects fail because of people and process challenges. How you change the organization into thinking a different way about compliance. For example, the security rule implementation is more aptly described as a change project. You got to introduce the fact that you're going to be doing risk assessments, and it's not just a one-time deal. We say minimum once a year. And if your environment changes, like you got bought out or you bought another company, then then you have to do one because your environment changed, right? So you have to change the culture uh, of how people think about compliance. And essentially, you've got to learn how to manage risk, right? So it, it's really a much more sophisticated um, initiative now because the game has changed. And the way to, and because of the complexity, and because most of the complexity is really organizational, getting your, getting those old grumpy docs to buy into the fact that they got to change. You know, some of them say, hey, I'd rather go to jail than comply with HIPAA, right? But usually those are the ones that have made a ton of money and they're going to retire in two years. If you got to still practice medicine for the next 10, well, you don't have the luxury of saying that, right? So what we like to think of is you need to use an agile methodology, okay? But what does that mean? in the compliance context. Well, it really means, essentially, at the end of the day, what you want it to mean, but agile compliance is a group of methods based on an iterative and incremental approach. In other words, get started. You don't really even understand the problem that you're solving and still get started. So we have a bunch of mini project plans so that you're not staring at that blank sheet of paper saying, oh my God, this is overwhelming. What do I do next, okay? And so Agile promotes adaptive planning, evolutionary development, implementation. Essentially, you're learning as you go. You're, you're, you're reinventing the organization's DNA, and you're not going to do it by, you know, step one, step two, step three, because there are no step one, step two, step threes. It's different for every organization. Agile is a, a 
conceptual framework that acknowledges that due to the changing operational, technical, and regulatory environment, the implementation cycle never ends. This is not a one-shot deal. This is a continuous, evergreen process, right? So we like to say that agile compliance is how an organization builds about changing its compliance DNA. Now, this is this is something that Tom Peters, the management consultant, coined well over 20 years ago, fell forward fast, which essentially means get started, make some mistakes, learn what you're doing, understand the problem better, fix it, and move on. That's how you get to closure faster with these kinds of wicked problems that have much more organizational complexity than they do technical complexity. So why fail forward fast? It's the only effective way of solving wicked problems. And I guarantee you that the HIPAA compliance initiative is a wicked problem. First of all, you don't understand the problem that you're really solving. Right? You don't really understand, you don't understand the requirements, you don't understand how you're going to implement it within your organization. And since you don't really understand the problem, there's no definitive problem like in an engineering sense. There can't be any definitive solution. Every solution uh, is going to be slightly different from an organ from one organization to another organization. Three says, look, there's there's no there's no right or wrong. There's just a, some solutions are better than others. Some are worse. Some are good enough. Every wicked every wicked problem is unique and novel. Every organization is unique and novel. And we all understand that compliance budgets are constrained. You know, you don't have all the money in the world to do everything you want to do. You're going to have to make some strategic decisions as you go and balance the risk of, hey, where do we focus, where we get the biggest bang for the buck, despite the fact that, you know, for example, I'd like to say that if you encrypt, 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 okay, that might be only 1% of the security rule, but it might fix 95% of the liability. Right, so those are the kind of decisions that you need to make. This is not this is not a linear process where you're going to just you think you're going to lay out these 169 requirements and just walk down them. Okay, so as it turns out, big problems like a HIP initiative require many small solutions. You're just going to iterate. So again, don't form a committee to name a committee to study the problem. That's that's death right there. Just get started. Okay, heavyweight compliance is focused on well-defined pain problems, right? So you got a governance model and compliance and risk management is this really formal thing in the past. It was kind of a formal academic thing. And it was static, it didn't change. It was linear. You get step one, step two, step three. So those problems that we call pain problems are like building bridges. We understand the physics of building a bridge. We understand the mathematics. Man has built thousands of bridges right now. We understand that problem. Standing up a HIPAA compliance program is a wicked problem. The organization really doesn't understand it. Even the privacy and security officer probably don't really fully understand it. Right? It's something that the understanding is going to come as you start solving the problem. And, and, and so that's the difference. And, and so you need two different approaches. Okay, so pace of innovation is accelerating. We all know that fee for service is dead. Accountable care organizations are being introduced. Uh, the risk of high-tech HIPAA has gone up through the roof. And we're going to talk about Anthem. We're going to talk about the fines that are likely to come out of that. We're going to talk about class action lawsuits that are going to come out of that. Uh, and here's just quickly some of the change that's happening right now uh, in the healthcare industry, right? I'm sorry, that's a little too fast, right? Electronic health records, patient portals, pay for performance, which is all about ACOs, ICD-10, if it ever shows up, the Affordable Care Act quality measures, pricing transparency. I mean, the healthcare industry is going through 150 years of change in five. So it's essentially mergers and acquisitions, it's essentially being turned upside down, right? Big data and analytics. There's a new buzzword that comes out every day, it seems like. So now it's counterintuitive, but because there's all this change going on, this might be a better opportunity if you're a compliance officer or privacy officer, to go make the case as to why you should be also changing the organization's DNA vis-a-vis -vis compliance. Okay, and here, you know, obviously we hear about, uh, you know, Chinese hackers and, you know, every other day, right? So it's, I think, easier now, given where we're at in this 24-7, 365 online world, it's easier now because of the headlines to try to make that case. 
So agile versus heavyweight. In heavyweight, you define all the requirements up front. You test all the requirements. You integrate all the requirements in the workflow. You pick a date, and you have this big bang compliance launch. But that really equals a really slow feedback. It took you a year and a half to do that, and you got some of the stuff wrong. Uh, now you're a year and a half into it, and you have maybe you, you, you missed the boat. The agile is define, test, integrate, and verify. Define, test, integrate, and verify. Solve the problem as you go. Make progress as you go. Be able to have little ticky marks. That, okay, we did this, we did this, we did this. Oh, no, we haven't done the other, but, but you're learning about the problem as you go. I'm not going to read these. You can read these in the slides. There's a difference between agile and compliance. But essentially, agile at the end of the day is going to be what you say. It's, it's how you iterate. By you, I mean, it's how, you're, it, it's how your organization iterates. Don't. Don't turn agile into some sort of religion. It's just a, an iterative process. Okay, I'm going to let you guys read this too because these have to do with the many project plans that we have available to get people started. If you buy our subscription, I don't want to bore you with, you know, the details of them, but we do have them uh, out there. And cause I want to, I want to um, allow for some more time for Q and A. Essentially, so you guys can. If you have some questions about these uh, project plans, you can email me. So, avoiding willful neglect. Right, this ought to be near and dear to your heart. So, the gnashing of teeth regarding HIPAA audits is entirely based on a well-known dirty little secret. Right, we all know this. Most covered entities and business associates, both large, small, and everything in between, are not likely to do well when their compliance initiatives are placed under a microscope. If you get audited, it's going to ruin your day. It's going to be a bad day for you, right? How do you make that day a little less bad? So this is minimum requirements for the security rule, right? Minimum, so that you can avoid willful neglect. You let it provide visible demonstrable evidence of your most recent risk assessment. If you don't have a risk assessment, you're getting water, right? That's the bottom line. If you don't have a risk assessment, there's no way you can make a good faith argument that you tried to comply with the security rule because the security rule is all based on the foundation of having a risk assessment. Okay. And other minimum requirements. Name your security officer. Provide some evidence of your security rule risk management program. Remember that the risk assessment is just an analytical step. You actually don't implement what you analyze and the additional controls until, until you get to the second implementation specification of the first standard of the administrative safeguards, which is um, essentially your risk management program. And your risk management program really kind of swallows the rest of the rule. Okay, so at least have some, give some thought as to what your risk management program looks like. Provide evidence that you are tracking and analyzing security incidents. It's basic. It's not that hard to do. Implement an email program. Name a contact within your organization where uh, security incidents get, uh, who gets notified of security incidents. Adopt a methodology for analyzing them, right? It's not that hard. But the hard part is changing the organization. The hard part is getting the executives to say, you know, we need to do this. We need to start changing. Tracking incidents, here's how we're going to do it, blah, 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 right? So that, it sounds easy enough, but it's not. It's not because it's got organizational complexity. Provide evidence that you've trained your workforce on a security rule, right? So we have security rule training with tests. Run them through that. Have them take the test. If they don't get 70 or better, then have them take the test again. Provide evidence that you have up-to-date security policies and procedures. So we give you model policies and procedures. But if they're just sitting on their file server, if you've never talked to the executive team about it, if you didn't distribute it to your organization, then you know they're worthless, right? You distribute the policies to your organization, and then have people sign that they've read it. At a minimum, you can say, "Hey, we, we've done that." Privacy. Well, let me stop. So that's the security rule, minimum requirements. Any questions there? Not at this time, Carlos. Okay, so privacy rule minimum requirements. Look, the omnibus rule forced you to change your notice of privacy practices. If you haven't done that, you better get on that, right? Business associate agreements had to be changed as per the omnibus rule. You had a, 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 a if, if prior to the omnibus rule you had you were 
high tech compliant with your BAA, you got a year, uh, you've got grandfather in for a year, but that year's over, right? Other policy procedures that are on this rule ready. If you're relying on that three ring binder from 2005, you're in willful neglect, right? Start, you can count on $50,000 fines per incident, per violation. Name your privacy officer. You got to have a named privacy officer. That privacy officer's personnel file should reflect that he or she is the privacy officer, okay? Pri provide evidence that you have distributed your omnibus rule ready policies and procedures. Distribute them. Talk to the executive team about them. Have everybody sign them. Provide evidence that you trained your staff on omnibus rule ready policies and procedures. Like I say, we have training that you go through. Our training is generally an hour or so long. It's video based. You can do it as a group. You can do it for individuals. Get people trained. It's not that rocket science. Just run them through the training. Provide evidence that you have policies and procedures that allow you to fulfill the requirements of the privacy rules, patients, bill of rights. What is that? Notice the privacy practices, the ability to uh, turn around a request for PHI when a patient requests PHI. It's got to be done within 30 days. If you can't do it within 30 days, you got to ask the patient for an extension in writing. There are some due process requirements in the rule. Do you have anybody on your staff that even understands how to do that? How are you going to track the request? How are you going to track when it was issued so that you could prove, so you're not in the signet problem, so you can say, no, 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 we have the spreadsheet that we track. Every time we get a request for PHI, we log it, we track who it was from, we track the date that it came in, we track whether or not we had an extension, we track when we uh, delivered the PHI, we track who we talked to, you know, blah, blah, blah. Look, before, prior to the High Tech Act, and even now, not that many patients ask for their PHI, but if they start asking for them in any kind of significant numbers, you're probably not going to be ready for it. Okay, breach notification minimum requirements. Provide visible demonstrable evidence that your organization has a methodology in place for analyzing security incidents. Obviously, you can't analyze security incidents that you're not tracking, right? You can't manage what you don't measure. Ensure that all security incidents are analyzed and documented according to your methodology. Ensure the organization has model letters, templates, etc., necessary in order to appropriately notify when, not if, the inevitable breach occurs, and ensure that required individuals, including the management team, are trained and knowledgeable regarding notification requirements. What are you going to do when you get that breach? You know, who do you notify? You know, how quickly do you want to get counsel involved? Like real quick, right? What's the plan that you have in place uh, for that? Okay. So this short list of imperatives was not intended to provide a checklist of items that will help you pass, quote unquote, an HHS audit. It's not a checklist of items that might keep you from being fine. You probably will still be fine if that's all you did. But it does describe a bare minimum set of items that may keep you from a finding of willful neglect. And again, I just want to remind you that that's willful neglect is where it starts at $50,000 per incident or per violation. Okay, real quick, shameless plug, I mean, you guys know that we sell a subscription product. We, we recently introduced audit preparation products for the, for the security rule, a, a general audit preparation product, a security rule audit preparation product. Uh, within the next month, we'll have a privacy rule audit pr uh, preparation product. All of those products can be purchased individually or you get all 25 or 26 uh, for seven ninety five a year. So we like to think that we provide the recipe, the how-to, not just the ingredients. We provide educational products that will get you started day one. They're agile. They're agnostic vis-a-vis VAs or CEs. They're wetware. Uh, you can take advantage of the look inside feature for each product on our store uh, to get better uh, acquainted with what you get in each product. So with that, I will take a few more questions if there are any. Yes. Does the 30-day extension to provide PHI still apply after the omnibus rule updates? Yes. I'm not aware that the omnibus rule updates changed anything to the, uh, specifically to the 30-day extension. I, I mean, I'm, I'm saying that from memory, and it's been months now since I looked at the, the omnibus, that 500-page PDF that was the omnibus rule. But... I don't, I don't believe it changed the, um, there, 
there was some changes. There was some changes regarding whether or not whether or not the PHI was off site or something. But I don't think it changed the the thirty day requirement if if it's like live in your EHR system. Okay, you got to provide it in thirty days. If you can't, you got to have in writing. You got to get in writing. You got to ask the patient for an extension, and then you got to tell the patient in that request for an extension exactly when you are going to deliver it. Okay. In a uh, previous conversation, you mentioned risk assessment scanning tools. Can you suggest a few, please? Wow, well, I don't have that. I, I don't have that list available, and I've, I've looked at some that were. Um, well, there's a company called Fair Warning. They they play in this space. Okay, I don't really know, you know, how expensive they are or things like that. But you can do. Um, you just Google free network scanning tools, and you know, I mean, you know, you know, you're not going to get a user's manual. I mean, free is not totally free, but you could probably get it to work. I mean, some of these are are decent enough. Let me say this: it's better than nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, having that free stuff is better than nothing. And like I said before, you know, it, do a bad risk assessment uh, instead of doing no risk assessment. Just make it good faith effort to dig into it and see what you find, and you will find some stuff, you will fix some stuff, and you can say, hey, we did a risk assessment, we did the best that we did the best that we could do with the resources that we had, will that get you totally off the hook? No, but look, HHS built the flexibility principle into the security rule, it didn't say you had to do the best risk assessment, right, so there's a difference there. Now, I mean, obviously you can't put, throw some garbage together that you you know I mean that you're trying to pull the wool over HHS's eyes that's not going to work but but you know making a good faith effort doesn't mean you got to spend tens of thousands of dollars necessarily. That's all the questions we have for now. All right, very good. Thanks for listening. It's been uh, my pleasure being with you guys today.